Hello, and welcome back to Radio Free Urbanism, a podcast about urbanism and stuff. My name is Nick Laporte, and I am here for another bonus episode. We had a great one last week, and this week I have Tom. He's the founder and editor of Seattle Bike Blog. Please welcome Tom Fucolaro. Thanks for having me. So I'm excited to talk to you today because I had the chance to visit Seattle just a few weeks ago and do a bike tour. And that in itself was a great experience because I've been to Seattle several times, not like we were saying before the show, not a ton of times, but enough times that I'm familiar with the city, but I had never actually experienced it on two wheels. And I'm of the mind where that's one of the best ways to really experience a city. So for for it to have taken that long was really a disgrace on my part. <laughs> but uh, I have to say it was incredible in its own right. But after the fact, doing the research, because I'm, I'm going to be releasing a video about this whole bike tour I did and the history of Seattle cycling and also the future, it's been even more fascinating. And it's, and it's kind of really climbed the ranks in my mind as far as a cycling city goes. But uh, since I've just spent enough time talking and not introduced you enough, please tell us who you are. Uh, my name is Tom Fucoloro. So I write Seattle Bike Blog, which I founded in 2010. Um, and I also wrote a book called Biking Uphill in the Rain, the story of Seattle from behind the handlebars, uh, which came out uh, one year ago and, on University of Washington Press. And um, so I'm sort of a, an everyday part of my job is doing everyday bicycle news. And uh, the other part of my job was writing a book of kind of like deep history research into how the city and the bicycle kind of like grew together um, in a very interesting way. So I'm really looking forward to, to reading this book because I only found out about it recently. I actually had to order it because I couldn't find it anywhere locally, which is uh, too bad. So I'm really looking forward to, to reading it. It's on the top of my read list right I, now. I need to come to Vancouver and do a reading. I haven't done that yet. That would be fantastic. I'd and be then, right there. And then maybe I can <laughs> you know, convince some local bookstores to stock it. <laughs> a absolutely. Yeah, we'll get that going. Um, so let's go back a little bit because we talked about just a bit. You mentioned your book. You mentioned the bike blog. So I love people's origin stories. How did they really get to this place? And more importantly, what was like the, the, the thing that got you really excited about the bicycle for it to be such a, a mainstay in your life right now? Yeah. So I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, uh, a suburb of St. Louis called Crestwood. And, um, you know, I, I think like most, most kids, I grew up biking around the neighborhood, um, but there wasn't really anything to bike to, you know, other than like a playground. Um, I like the, there's this funny thing that happened where, uh, I would get driven to school and then after school, I would go out and stand in the car line and get in the carpool to come get driven home and then i drop my backpack inside grab hop on my bike and bike straight back to school to go play in the playground and it never once dawned on me that i could have just biked to school it's like it just but that's not like because biking was a thing you go and do for fun and cars are how you actually go places and it never dawned on me that the bike you could actually go places on the bike <laughs> <laughs> which like looking back on it now i have a kid who's in first grade and we love biking to school um it's just it it's amazing that um to me just to think back to that mindset where you know you just expect to drive everywhere so you know i got a job at 15 and a half the earliest that i could to save up money to buy a car and then i got my driver's license the very first day i possibly could and I bought a car as soon as I could afford one because the car was my my access to mobility and how I got out of the neighborhood. And um, uh, and so I basically worked all through high school just to like pay for the car, you know. Uh, and then I ended up going to college in Illinois in a small town and didn't really drive the car that much except to get to and from college. And then after college, I moved out to Denver um, where my girlfriend at the time uh was really in getting into biking and so i thought I, you know well i need to impress her so i got into biking <laughs> so she would think i was cool <laughs> and that's when i first started biking regularly like as an adult for transportation and i had this experience where i needed to buy us groceries and i went to the grocery store 
and I bought all the groceries we needed and I figured out how to attach the like, you know, with the paper bags to my rear rack. I think I had like a, you know, a, I had stolen a milk crate or something and, you know, zip tied that to the rack and I got all my groceries home and it was really easy. And like, as I rolled in with all my groceries, I just thought like, I had this like wave of euphoria and like this realization of like, I can, I don't need the car. Like, this is one of those things I thought I needed a car for buying groceries, but this was so much easier. <laughs> like, this is ridiculous. Like, what, what am I doing? Why did I not even see this before? And it was just, it was like this, like, revolutionary idea or the moment for me. Um, I just realized that, like, I didn't need that thing anymore. And so in the meantime, it was just collecting parking tickets. Denver does this thing where uh, they have street sweeping once a week. They don't actually sweep the streets, but they do give you tickets if you didn't move your car. <laughs> um and my car just collected these things because i just stopped driving i was biking everywhere and so i finally like convinced myself uh you know we decided we didn't want to leave denver this was 2009 um and we wanted to move to seattle where we had some friends and uh we didn't have any money <laughs> to do this and i thought well i could sell my car and we could use that money and so i did it i sold it to some guy on craigslist uh and like as i saw the car like turn the corner and go out of my view i felt this like amazing like weight off my shoulders and i was so scared that i was going to need this car and i was going to regret this decision um and as soon as like i've never once regretted it like it's just been like such a great thing that i did <laughs> um you know it got me out to this place it's how i showed up in seattle with just a bike um and it's kind of set my whole life on this this path of just, you know, really being dedicated to the idea that you don't need to own a car. The car just is this thing, this constant threat of, you know, a thousand dollars because it makes a weird sound. At any moment, that sound could, you turn on the, the car and there's a, a weird squeak you've never heard before. And that's a thousand dollars. You know, it's like, yeah, but like you can just get rid of it and then that's gone. That you never, ever have to worry about that ever again. Uh, and it's amazing and you never have to find parking. You don't have to care about the price of parking. You don't have to care about, uh, you know, getting back by a certain time because you know, all the parking spots get taken up and you never have to pay for insurance. I mean, it's, it's just like, it's, it's so such, it's so freeing. It's so liberating. And I think, you know, I'd been so convinced that, you know, the car was my access to freedom and mobility and in, I just assumed that so completely that um, I, I guess, uh, wasn't prepared to like for the reality that actually getting rid of the car is your key to freedom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I've kind of became a, a, a sell your car evangelist. <laughs> I love that. No, it, it really. Anytime I hear somebody's story about getting rid of their car, it it never ends badly. <laughs> right. It always seems to be a good thing. But it, it really reinforces that that saying that I love. And it's that bicycles offer the freedom that car ads promise. And it's so true. Like once you really live it, you know, I'm, I'm new to this. Like you've been doing this for a long time. You moved to Seattle in 2009, a year later started the bike blog. Like I only really started to get into this stuff over two years ago. Like that has been my main mm -hmm. focus. So it's been amazing to see so many people, especially like yourself who have been in it for so long. So speaking of which, how did you end up starting the bike blog? Yeah, so uh, I did the school newspaper in college. I was the editor my senior year. Um, and then that was my whole plan. I was going to become a newspaper journalist. Uh, and so I graduated in 2008 and went out in the world to become a newspaper journalist, which is like one of those like one-line tragedies. <laughs> it's like the worst possible year to try to yeah. get a career in newspaper journalism. So I had a really cool internship at the Kansas City Star that summer after I graduated. Um but the first, which is an amazing newspaper, um, you know, good circulation. Hemingway wrote for it. You know, it's like very storied and like old and cool. Um, and they still do really good work. But the first day I walked in, um, like everyone was crying. I was like, oh, no. And they just had their like, first ever like massive newsroom layoff round. And I was like, oh, this, this isn't going to work, is it? Like, I don't... <laughs> and sure enough, like complete hiring freeze like this is the kind of internship that if you you know 
if you do a good job, it usually turns into a, a full-time offer. This is sort of like a, a test. And it became clear there were going to be no offers. Um, they, were, they were only cutting. They were not adding. So, you know, in some ways, like, I was very disappointed at the time. Um, but I guess in retrospect, it was very liberating. You know, I had done, I had done all the steps that are supposed to lead to this career path. And the career path sort of closed the door on me. So it's sort of liberating because it's like, well, I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's just like this is, you know, the paths have all changed and I just had to figure out a different way in. So when I moved to Seattle and I was biking everywhere, working odd jobs, um, just noticing that, like, you know, Seattle already had a reputation for being a pretty good place to ride a bike. But all the bike lanes seemed to just sort of end or they were like right next to parked cars or. um you know, every time you got to an intersection, they just disappear and they're just, you have to just mix with traffic right when at the scariest point possible. Um, and, uh, or a lot of times they just like drew a picture of a bike in the middle of like a busy traffic lane. And I was like, is that, does this mean anything? Like, is this helping? Is this working? It doesn't feel any safer <laughs> that there's a picture of a bike on the road, like, um, uh, worn out by car tires, right? <laughs> um, stories all the time yeah it's it's almost like a threat rather than like you know assistance i dare you it's like this is what's going to happen to you yeah um uh and so i started looking around for people who were writing about the topic on a regular basis and i didn't find anyone who was kind of like fully dedicated to the beat so i thought that could be me <laughs> so i had no idea what i was talking about when i started it um but i was a journalist and you don't if you're a journalist, you don't have to know, like, be an expert in what you're talking about. You just have to be willing to put in the work to find an expert and ask them questions, right? Yeah. So that's that was how I started. You know, I just started this blog, and then I went out and I, you know, found anyone I could who was an expert, and um, you know, started just uh, at first I was writing like five posts a day, <laughs> which was way too many, but <laughs> I didn't know. Like, it was like the height of blogs. Like, blogs were still cool. Um, and that the blog has existed throughout the the lull in blogs. Now blogs are becoming cool again. So, I I out, I I, uh, I waited it out, and now the the cycle is back. So, I love that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just uh, you know, went out and just started asking as many questions to as many people as I could. Um, you know, meeting community organizations who are doing cool things. Um, writing about them, writing about people who do interesting things, writing about you know, bad things that happen to people. And then, um, you know, just really, really going heavily in on the, uh, uh, you know, the, the public processes that build bike lanes or don't build bike lanes, right? <laughs> like where, where did these things get up? And that's how I got, it became some, um, very embedded in city politics. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically what I do every day. <laughs> it's just, so that's your full-time gig. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That and Hawk in the book. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> so since we're there, tell us about the book. So, uh, I love the title because it's, it's so much in the face of, you know, at least two of the main things we hear about cycling is what you can't do. Oh, there's too many Hills, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's too rainy, which is obviously we hear the same thing here in Vancouver. So yeah, please tell us. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was, you know, right off the bat, um, you know, yeah, ad exactly. Addressing uh, the reasons people think that you can't do it. Um, and, uh, but that the, I, I did, it didn't set out originally to write a history book. It was supposed to be more of like a bike culture book, like a, a very light read. Um, but it, uh, I started writing it in, uh, at the end of 2019. <laughs> and my plan was to do these, like, kind of like in-depth features with interesting people where I like hang out with them for like a week and write like a cool like profile. Cause I, I love writing that way. But then 2020 happened and it became very uncool to hang out in people's living rooms for <laughs> long periods of time. What um, happened? <laughs> and so, but I w did have access to some very useful um, newspaper archives for the two major daily papers. Um, and so I just started there. And then as the physical archives and libraries reopened, I, spent a bunch of time digging around dusty boxes and learning how to use microfilm. Um, and I ended up sort of accidentally tracing um, 
like from the moment the first bicycle arrived in Seattle until the modern day in this book, which was cool. I didn't realize I was going to be able to do that. And it's, I also, as I was working on, it, I kind of realized that, you know, that the city and the bicycle sort of rose together, you know, Seattle um, is a very new city as far as cities go. I think Vancouver's even newer. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Vancouver, Washington is the, is the old one. Yeah. Um, but, uh, that, you know, Seattle really started to explode right when bicycling was exploding. And so as the city was expanding really quickly, bicycling was like in the midst of a fad phase and, uh, all the, all the wealthy, powerful, you know, policymakers in the city were out biking. And so the city sort of, you know, built these bike paths into the forest, into the middle of nowhere, and then developed around those paths. And those paths became major boulevards and um, major, like, structure of the city. Um, so, like, the, the bicycles, like, imprinted in the, in the city as it is, um, which is really cool and really interesting. Um, and yeah, and so that I just sort of kept following the history all the way through up to the modern day, and it kept being interesting, and I just kind of let the research guide me. Um, and so it really is more of a Seattle history book that just has the lens of bicycling, right? <laughs> yeah, um, no, it, it's fantastic. That's what I'm most excited to read about it, because I just, I love history in general, but to hear more about cycling history is fascinating. I did my own little research here. And I'm, I'm very curious to find out what's in your book, but uh, finding about the history of Seattle and the bicycle and how long it's been there. It's been, it's been fascinating. Like, like I found out where exactly the first bicycle was being sold on mm-hmm. Front Street, which I think now is First Street over at Pioneer Square, which uh, ironically is now a parking lot. I mean, this, the city burnt down later, but still, like, it's kind of ironic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's amazing. Um, but to the title of your book... Can you comment on that a little bit about the reasons why people say we can't bicycle? Yeah. You know, wherever you go in the world, every city has its own, you know, list of reasons why you, people just can't bike there. Um, and they're all BS. <laughs> um, <laughs> but especially, I think I've just always found the Seattle excuses, especially galling um, because a people have been biking here. Uh, basically since the beginning of the city, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, colon- the white colonized city anyway, um, you know, they had, they had their like pioneer days where there was just mud roads and like a couple buildings. And so no one was biking then. It was hard to get a bicycle all the way out here. But as soon as the city started becoming like an actual city, the bike was already there. So the idea that you can't do it is ridiculous. I mean, like they were doing it and the roads were muddy. And they were still Vikings. They didn't have right? they the derailleur didn't exist yet. <laughs> they didn't have uh, Gore-Tex. Yeah, so but they were doing it. So I don't know, what's your excuse? But um you know, I think also just that you know, Pacific Northwest climate is I mean, it's the best possible climate for biking year round. Like it is it never well, practically never deep freezes. You know, ice is really difficult to bike on so places that get like a ton of ice in the winter like some people will always do it but it's going to be a hardcore thing that never happens here um very very rarely happens here (laughs) um it almost never gets too hot you know so like you know desert cities yeah it's gonna be really hard to bike there's still people who do it but it's gonna be really hard to bike you know midday in the summer um but uh that doesn't really happen here so like if you're going to use a bike year round to you know do your get around do your daily life your errands you know whatever it is that you need to do you can do it on a bike um no matter what and i think that's you know it's people make way too big a deal about the rain because rain is such an easy problem just get good gloves and a rain jacket and some rain pants and put fenders on your bike i mean like we have solutions you know yeah um yeah i mean go out in clothes that are going to soak through, then you're going to have a bad time. But you know, we just get different clothes. <laughs> like you know, yeah. we you can uh, you can fix these problems. Um, and so I think that's a big thing that uh, that Seattle and Vancouver actually have going for it is the weather. Um, even though it's the thing that people think would stop us, 
And then the hills, you know, it's funny. If you look at the um, the cities with the highest rate of in North America, the highest bike commute rates, uh, a lot of them are hilly. <laughs> um, That's weird. It is really weird. But like San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, Portland. Um, and so like and then like Minnesota isn't necessarily hilly, but it sure does freeze you know, yeah. <laughs> in the winter. Just bitterly, bitterly, ridiculously cold. You know, these places all have, these are like our top cycling cities and they all have these factors that people say we couldn't possibly bike there. And then we have all these like cities with supposedly great weather that have really low biking numbers. Um, you know, and some of that's culture. Some of that's the built environment. Well, most of it is the built environment. Um, but also, you know, maybe the things that people think make a good place good for cycling um, isn't just like flat monotony. <laughs> You know, I think the hills provide a, a sense of adventure and excitement and they, they, they mix things up and, you know, they can be impediments to people. I mean, it is difficult to go up hills and, you know, sometimes you have to exert yourself. Sometimes you can find ways to do it without exerting yourself. Um, some people like exerting themselves, but you, I'm not particularly one of those people and I still mm -hmm. do it. So, you know, you don't have to be really into fitness, but you can. Or you can just get lower gears and go really slow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with the advent of e bikes and, you know, and e assist e is incredible. And, you know, it's just like the whole thing of, you know, you go up a hill and yeah, it's hard, but then you get to go down the hill and that's really <laughs> yeah. fun and really fast. Yeah. And you get the view at the top and it's beautiful. And, um, you know, I think that's one thing I hear all the time from people who just take up bike commuting or start biking for transportation is, they're just amazed by how much more beautiful this place is than they thought it was. Like they may have lived here their whole lives or for, for many years. And it wasn't until they started biking that they really realized how beautiful it is, you know, because, you know, if you just stick to the handful of busy roads and highways, um, like those are like the ugliest places in the entire city. And you spend all your time there. You might think the city's ugly, which is wild because you, if you bike, you end up on really pretty side streets and, you know, maybe roundabout, you know, paths that aren't direct, but they're less steep, right? And they end up being the really beautiful places to bike. And um, yeah, I think that, the, you know, the terrain of this place is what makes it so exciting. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, a shocking number of people will say, my bike commute is the best part of my day. You know, and I think that a lot of people, other people think of commuting as this this chore and then oh it's the worst in a car <laughs> oh i hated driving to work every both ways terrible it's it was like 10 15 minutes terrible yeah but on then, a bike way different yeah yeah i mean that, that's a, such a powerful statement to me that you know you can turn a chore into the thing you look forward to um yeah that's awesome i think that's really cool and uh yeah i, th I think that the hills are part of that it's Absolutely. I love that. So you've been car free since you moved to Seattle. Well, before you moved to Seattle when you sold yep. it, when you were in Denver. Okay. Well, there's another one of these things that people always bring up. What about kids? Right? So you're a dad. So what about becoming a father has been challenging or what has been rewarding about that experience? Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll also say like, you know, the things that work for me aren't going to work for everybody. Sure. You know, we, what, yeah. One big thing that we have going for us is that neither of us have any family here. And so we moved here and we have just committed ourselves to not having a car kind of the whole time. And so we don't have like family members we need to visit out who live out in the suburbs. Um, you know, we don't have um, reasons that we need to go places that are not easily accessible by transit or biking. Um, and so we've sort of just designed our lives around transit and biking. Um, and there's, there's plenty that you can do, <laughs> but there may be people out there who have things that they have to do that are not well connected. Um, and they're going to find this a lot more difficult. Um, but because we've done, you know, been doing this from the beginning and, um, that same thing applies to our life with our kid, you know, that the things that she does are things that we can bike to or take transit to um easily enough 
you know, which, you know, she went to a preschool, a really cool preschool in Pike Place Market. You know, that was more than five miles away from our house. And we biked there every single day, which ends up being like 20 miles round trip for the whole day. Cause they're back, right. they're back. Right. Um, which was, I mean, that, that was a long, that was a lot of biking. Um, you know, she spent a lot of time on the bike. She's gotten very good at spending a lot of time on the bike. <laughs> um, she's, she enjoys it. We found music that she likes to listen to. She's back there singing along the whole way and asking us questions. And we're always talking and learning. And we have, we know where every single little pocket playground and park and <laughs> is between our house and downtown now. You know, we're always like, which one do we want to do today? And we try to make it a little adventure. Um, but, you know, there there is an element of like, she only has so much stamina to you know sit on the back of a bike um but she's really good at taking transit um you know and she yeah we we've we've yet to encounter like a situation where we wished we had a car with her um it's you know i think that biking and transit if you live that life you just have a little bit more like uh acknowledgement that like of that whole idea like the the journey is part of the adventure you know, it's not a, just a means to an end. Like, yeah, you just have to embrace like, okay, we're going to go on a little bit of a bus journey today. And that's going to be part of the fun thing that we're doing is a bus ride. <laughs> you know, yeah. and you um, can learn about your city that way too, right? It's such a great way yeah. to, to learn about it and stumble across things you might've otherwise not seen. Absolutely. So some people get hung up cause you know, you look at Google and you, you look at the difference and it's like, oh, I could drive there in 20 minutes, but it's going to take me an hour on the bus. Um, and they'll be like, oh, you know, can't justify that increase in time. But I think if you stop looking at it that way and just commit to the idea that, well, the bus ride is part of the day and it's not a, it's not a waste of time. It's just a part of your time. Um, it, that's a lot easier to do. Yeah. And they can be more productive too. Like on a bus or a train, you can be on your phone, you could be reading a book, you could be working on stuff and on a bike. Oh my gosh. I have so many colleagues. They, they talk to me. How, how can you bike to work? Does it take longer? It doesn't take that much longer. It's like an extra five minutes round trip for me, at least post to a car. It's not far. It's like five, less than five kilometers one way. But like, I'll talk to my colleagues and they're like, oh, I got to go to the gym after work. I'm like, what do you do there? Oh, I go on the treadmill or I go on the stationary bike. I'm like, just get on your bike, just bike to work. You won't right. have to go to the gym. Like right. it's part of your day. It's so much easier that way. So yeah, I think there's that that's built into it too. People don't think about the time in between destinations when you're driving, what kind of time you have to take to park, just finding parking, dealing with paying for parking, stuff like that isn't included, right? Like that, maybe that should be included on the, the Google transit app that actually tells you that, Hey, it might take this long to find parking or something like right. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as far as Seattle's doing mm -hmm. now in my own mind, I have like a ranking that I would give it, but where would you say it is? In, in the United States or even North America? You know, that's hard for me to say because since I've had a kid, I've traveled a lot less. <laughs> um, I, but I think that it's uh, it's rising. It's risen a lot in the past 10 years. I would say when okay. we first, well, when I first started writing the blog, it was pretty high, but it was falling. And there lots of other places were catching up finally. And then I would say the first couple years I was writing, maybe the first five years, uh, Seattle was falling behind. We were we were still painting Sharrows while other places were, you know, Chicago, places like Chicago were making protected bike lanes downtown. We were still like painting Sharrows in the middle of busy traffic lanes, right? Like there was this era where we were still like we were doing last gen bike stuff, <laughs> and other places had moved forward and they'd sort of like leapfrog Seattle. But then starting in 2015, um, the city passed a um, you know, in 2014, 2015, we, we first we passed a new bike plan that had like modern stuff in it, <laughs> protected bike lanes and neighborhood greenways, um, which were modeled off of the Vancouver model, um, more so than the Portland model. Um, and then uh, the next year we passed a funding measure to help fund the stuff that was in that plan directly, and the, the voters approved it. And, um, so we kind of had this uh, like voter mandate plus the money kind of all together. And so the city was able to go out and they, they've done a lot since um, 
since you know starting in 2016 um not as much as they could have which was part of my job right like it's one of these things where like i'm stuck in this place where i know because i write about this every day i know every single delay and cancellation and disappointment um but also if you take a step back and you look at what we've actually done it's amazing right so like somehow both these things are true at the same time um that's like the um the difficult thing about talking about the progress of biking in seattle is yeah we could have done more but we did like a lot like you can bike um all the way through downtown without ever leaving a protected bike lane um you can bike all the way from the the Berkman trail which is like the the rail trail project that puts seattle on the map because it was one of the first in the united states um, and actually sort of set some of the precedents to allow rail trails to become adopted elsewhere which is a really cool story that's in the book um you know that's always been like the the most popular um place for biking in the city but uh you know, now it connects to a network of protected bike lanes that go all the way along the lake and then through the heart of downtown um, and connect down into uh, on on their way to South Seattle. And then you hit your first like really bad missing link, <laughs> which is to get into the <laughs> the South End. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's a work in progress, but also it's it's a lot. I mean, like that, those were like a series of very difficult and expensive projects. <laughs> um that went way over budget and you know we've had to really like work through a lot of issues um to make them happen but now they're there and they're um very successful like the when i first moved here the only people biking downtown because you, you had if you wanted to bike downtown you had to mix with traffic it was the only way you had to bike and mix traffic and you had to be comfortable and willing to do that and if you weren't then you weren't biking downtown so the only people there were like hardcore commuters and bike messengers and pedicab drivers <laughs> like that was it um nobody else would do it um and you, it was hard to blame them it didn't look fun i'm sure people would see someone biking downtown think they they're crazy um and i don't know maybe they're not wrong i did it but <laughs> 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 but now that there's this you know network of protected bike lanes and you don't need to like mix with traffic to bike there you see all kinds of people on bikes and scooters um doing all kinds of things, you know, shopping, going to work, being a tourist, going to a sports event, uh, just getting from, they're just trying to get from their office to transit, right? And it's faster to hop on a bike or scooter or whatever to do it. Like, there's this whole mix of life that's now happening in our bike lanes that um, has been, really been enabled by all this, these projects. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just, it's amazing to see um, and I, I think Seattle should be very proud of what it's accomplished. And I think it needs to sometimes when you're in it hard, <laughs> it's, it's easy to focus on the complaints and the negatives and you kind of like lose sight of like, wow, we, we, you know, we've done a lot as a city. <laughs> um, and most importantly, the city is doing these things and we're not facing like huge backlash. Like mm -hmm. we're not getting like businesses to come out like the, the major business, um, organization is uh, you know at least on paper is in support of this idea you know every once in a while like a hotel will be mad about a bike lane in front of their like loading you know their ballet area or something right and we got to figure out how to deal with that issue and that's like that's as bad as it gets it's just stuff like that it's like you know one hotel at a time kind of stuff that's amazing yeah, yeah. it is amazing because I can't even imagine um Ten years ago, I couldn't have imagined this would have been the, the way we things would be. Um, so that was incredible. Uh, so it's on that note about uh, objections and pushback that we get, so you mentioned the Burke Gilman Trail, which I had the opportunity to ride, which was fantastic. Um, and something that I got mentioned to me was just briefly. Uh, it was kind of just in passing, but since I've learned quite a bit about it, and it's the what I'm I'm dubbing the Battle in Ballard. So Ballard being the neighborhood in, in the north part of Seattle uh, that it, it goes through. So there's something called the missing link. So can you tell us about the missing link? What is it? What's yeah. going on there? Yeah, so the <clears throat> Seattle's first big um, like bike infrastructure investment was the Berkeley Trail, which happened in the 70s. And it's a, an old rail line that got abandoned and 
a bunch of neighbors kind of rallied to get the city um, and the, the state leaders, especially the federal leaders for the state, to um, help make it a, a walking and biking trail. And we needed the federal leaders because there's a railroad and railroad stuff is regulated by the federal government. So there's limited things the city could have done. So the city was there prepared to take on the trail. They needed federal support to allow them to do that. And so they did all that. And um, yeah, yeah, that that map sure uh, glosses over a couple issues. <laughs> so it is it is complete um, for a very long time heading east out of if you see where it says Fremont, um, kind of at the southernmost point there. Heading east, it goes on forever and ever and ever, and it connects to other rail trails and just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And it's amazing. It's awesome. If you go west, there's a section from where where it says the end, which is a park called Golden Gardens, which is beautiful. There's a section from there all the way to the locks, which is kind of not visible in that map, kind of right below the W in Woodland Park Zoo on that map, is the uh, the locks. Um, where the Puget Sound, uh, which is saltwater, meets the um, Salmon Bay, which is uh, freshwater from the lakes. And so there's a lock system. There's a little bit of a, you know, it's not very high, the elevation difference, but it's high enough. Um, and you can actually walk your bike across the locks, which is an experience, <laughs> especially when it's very busy. Uh, it's very crowded. It always works. I always make it through somehow. Um, <laughs> but then there's a gap between the locks and um, like I'm right there in the middle of Ballard, which is the map you're showing. So the red dot is the locks is where the locks are located. Um, the red dot on the left, I should say. So there's the section where there was supposed to be a trail built in like the early 2000s. And it's been held up in court ever since. And the city has been consistent the entire time that we want to build this trail and um, public opinion has been consistent the entire time that people want them to build this trail. Um, but there's a handful of uh, wealthy businesses um, on the, this is sort of like an industrial area. This is like, um, you know, there's like fueling stations for the Alaskan fishing fleet and there's, um, a bunch of like maritime based businesses right along the water line there. And they've got a bunch of money and they have no, for some reason they've decided and it's really just a kind of a handful of people <laughs> have decided that over their dead body, will there be a trail here? And they're willing to put in an absolutely irrational amount of money into lawyers and defining ways to just stall it. Like they're like, they're barely like they can't defeat it. But they can keep, they figured out ways to just stall it in court and come up with like some sort of like new bit of red tape. And oh, you didn't like dot all your I's and cross all your T's in this part of your environmental impact statement. And like just like all this like ridiculous stuff. Um, and it's just been held up in court ever since. And the city has, to their discredit, somehow been incapable of winning these court cases. <laughs> Even though, like, to, to the outside observer, it's absurd. Like, um, you know, they always get rejected for things that have nothing to do with any issue that any person actually cares about. Um, but it's just a technicality. Um, and somehow they keep not winning. So it's just a, this extremely frustrating situation because the where the blue line is there is a road called Shilshol. And it's the most direct route if you're um, on a bike and you're trying to get between where the the two trail ends and connect them and continue out to golden gardens. Um, and so that's where people bike, but it's like really poorly. It's like a street that's in very poor condition. And during the weekdays, it has a lot of truck traffic and um, there's no safe place to bike. Like there's, there's no good options. There's no, like you can't even, there's not even like a sidewalk you could bike on if you want to, even though that's not a great option, but you know, sometimes it's the only option <laughs> depending on the street, but that's, that's not even here. Like, it's a really scary place to bike or you can try to weave through the neighborhood a little bit more, but it's very slow going. There's sections that are like cobblestones. <laughs> um, and once a week, there's a big farmer's market in the middle of it that you can't, that you can't bike through. Right. So um, there's just kind of like this weird area where there's no good bike route through it. There's no good option. Everything has 
significant downsides. Um, people keep getting hurt trying to cross it because there's so many different hazards and none of them are fixed. And because it's tied up in court, the city has limited on even like its ability to go out and make temporary fixes because then they'll be accused of defying the court order about stopping their project on the street. And it's just so frustrating. It is like, you know, some sort of like a like a, a, a damning parable about the state of um, the the environmental review system that it can stop a bike trail <laughs> and lead to injuries. Right? It's wild. Which should be the opposite of how these laws would be working, right? Yeah, it's, it is it is crazy. It's been very interesting to dive deep and see all the media that's available to watch that's been going on for like, like the earliest one I could find was from, I think, 96 or 98, which was literally a video from the engineering department, 29 reasons why you should reject this missing link to build it. And it was like 20, like 29 reasons. Oh, that's a lot of reasons. But then every reason was basically, oh, this business. And then this it was just all different, different businesses. It was going to affect allegedly. Anyway, uh, most recently I found from August and you've posted about this on your blog, but this is from the city. This is the most recent proposed route, which was another one of the compromised routes, which goes up Leary, which allegedly is like a lot of trucks go down there and then market, which, which is like the main street that would connect to, uh, the, the later part on the left that we, we showed earlier. So w tell us about this. Like, is this going to happen or is it still just another, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, this is not, this is not the, the bike organization's preferred route let's put it that way yeah um this is a compromise that uh the council member for this district named dan strauss has put forward i actually i like the idea of this project like i got some qualms with some of the details but i'd be fine if this gets built um there's already like a building that's threatening to sue it saying it should be on shill shoal oh my god <laughs> so what's frustrating is we actually have a design that's at 100% completion, like it's ready for crews to go out tomorrow and create it. Like it's, it's ready to build, which is at great expense, right? That goes along shill shill. Like it's done and it's just held up in court. And it's been held up in court for so long that this, this idea is like, well, we need to just build something that goes through here that is connected. Um, and so I'm not against that idea. I'm, you know, realistically building this probably means we won't build the other option um which is frustrating because this will be this will have much this will be much slower and it will have a lot more driveways and intersections and things to cross where the other route is going to have like a couple driveways and that was it um which is much you know every, every single time you introduce the conflict point you introduce like potential for conflict right um but this is also going to potentially, you know, make the streets that it goes along a lot safer. It's going to do some traffic calming on those streets just by nature of taking up space on those streets. Some of them are, are way too wide. This is an area that was sort of um, built out as an industrial area that's now like a very dense, popular neighborhood. A lot of people moving there, a lot of apartment buildings going up in the area. Um, so the streets don't match the uses so it makes sense to do a big traffic calming project on these streets so i like a lot of these elements of this project we did just fund it through i think it might happen if i was going to bet i would say it will happen and i'll i will support it i'm you know i've got i'm gonna keep fighting for my design changes um but i'm definitely going to support it because we do need something and also um i think a lot of the other benefits of it are very good uh, but it's it's definitely frustrating because it feels like a a retreat um over just some bs complaints um that have nothing to do with like all like the reasons that it's held up in court have zero to do with safety or like impact on like the ability for these businesses to operate which are the two things that people think that it's about it's not about either of those things it's about like oh we didn't find your analysis of this thing to be sufficient according to the letter of the law <laughs> it's like <laughs> you know <laughs> it's and then like uh the design involved them moving there's like this railroad that nobody uses that's technically not defunct yet 
and the city was going to at the city's own expense you know not not charging the railroad a dime was going to like realign the railroad so that it'd be you can make a safer crossing of the trail because it kind of goes on a weird angle they're just going to like make it a little more proper and but the railroad is part of the appellant group so they sued through the federal government like oh you can't make uh changes to our rails that we don't agree to and the federal government is very like like the protections for railroads are very strong um and so they sided with the railroad so the city can't build the design that way they had to like like all right well we can i guess redesign it with the railroad still in place <laughs> but like all these like ridiculous things um and each, each of these things took like two years to resolve right and then by the time they resolve that they've come up with like five more things they're going to try to sue on <laughs> you know Oh my god. It's like the the plan is to delay it until it's no longer politically feasible to build it. And it's frustrating to see that plan work. Like like you know, even just not even as like a bicycle person, but as just like a person who lives in the city. That shouldn't work. You should like you shouldn't just if you have enough money you can stop a popular project that's you know, been voted on by the elected representatives of our city um that we're going to change the use of this public land uh to help incur you know make it easier to bike through this area um a couple people with enough money um shouldn't just be able to stop it um because they want to um that's just wrong it's like not democratic <laughs> you know it's like, rough it's 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 yeah like i said it's it's wild to look into this and see that it's happening and how it's happening like you can understand why people might oppose it and that's going to happen in almost anything that you're going to build. But the fact that they can do it seemingly so easily by just, you know, throwing some money at the lawyers and finding loopholes and getting it to, to stop. But there was some good I mean, things, you know, there's... to their defense, they did work very hard. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't fair, easy. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, put a, they decided that this was going to be like <laughs> the thing. This is like, this is like legacy stuff. Like, I will be known for stopping this, you know, like, oh, God. this is, it's, it's weird. People try really hard to make sure that everybody knows they're they're kind of a dick. It's pretty I wild, know. but <laughs> like, man, you could you could have been known for like like I don't know, building like homelessness shelters or something, you know, like yeah. something good. Like yeah. why are you going to be known for this? There has been development though along the corridor slowly and one of them that popped up that I saw recently this is from over a year ago but I thought it was really entertaining and it's like guerrilla urbanism or tactical urbanism or something like that and this is uh you posted this on the blog back in September so what we're looking at this is underneath the Ballard Bridge just at the eastern end of the missing link along the Burt Gilman Trail where there's a there's a bike path I'm trying to explain this to people who might be listening there's a bike path that you can see uh there's a gravel pit and then there's a somebody put a ramp with a stenciled S dot on the little wooden ramp. So can you tell us what's going on here? S dot being the Seattle Department of Transportation. Yeah. yeah so luckily this has all changed now. Um, but they were, they've been tra so these tracks are where a lot of people are getting injured. Um, these are the tracks that go at a very weird angle, kind of across the street. And there's no good way to cross it. So you can see how they're desperately trying to get kind of force people biking to make sharp turns to slow way down and then cross the tracks like perpendicularly, perpendicularly. Yeah. Um, so that their wheels don't get stuck because the gaps between the tracks and the road are messed up. Um, and so the gravel pits was, was one of their worst ideas because the idea is like, you know, drawing the lines on the, you know, just painting lines on the street wasn't working. People were still just kind of biking their own route at a bad angle across the tracks and then getting hurt because um, people just taking the most direct route people don't like doing sharp turns if they don't have to so the gravel they dug these gravel pits hoping that would like force people to do it but you can kind of see that there's like tire ruts all through the gravel like even, that's, even that didn't work and now people started like slipping in the gravel and crashing um but so this was a joke that someone made that i still have no idea who did it but they they made a little ramp they're like this is our new plan the, 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 our newest, our newest idea is, I don't know, just fly over all of this. <laughs> it's so unsafe anyway. Like, is the ramp really that much less safe than what you've created? But what's cool, one thing I'll give the city credit for is, so the railroad needed city, the city to sign off on like a, they were, te they were transferring ownership of this railroad from one railroad company they own to a different railroad company they own. 
and they needed the city council to like sign off on it and so the council was like well we're gonna get our pound of flesh here and they like we will only do that if you let us pave over these tracks because they're not used anyway and so it's still not abandoned because they've you can't abandon a rail line that's has a railroad user who's willing to use it yeah here you go but they've paved over it so you can't use them so there's still active rails but you literally can't use them i don't understand it's a completely absurd situation but we paved over them which is sick um and they what's funny is the they were storing their like they had this like uh, antique uh railroad engine and the little house they had for it was um on the camera side of what we're looking at right here but the the area that they're actually trying to use every once in a while is on the other side so they had to like abandon their home and like get the the engine out and so now it like i don't know i don't know where it lives now um but they had to find some other home for it because they can't even access it anymore because of this but the city wasn't going to sign the paperwork unless they did that so that's how ugly it's gotten it's like this weird like all right well if you're going to pull these tricks we're going to pull these tricks back and <laughs> it's Spring ugly fight let's go it is it is this ugly fight but i haven't heard of anyone crashing here since it was it was like one or two people a month were going to the hospital at yeah. this location for years and years and years and um so many like broken collarbones and concussions and stuff yeah um and i haven't heard anything since they did this so well i mean i i rode there and i i wouldn't even have known because it just seems like a bike path and you right. just ride through it it's fine like it's it's totally good now but yeah uh that's a huge problem is rails in general in cities i know like <clears throat> in a lot of cities with a lot of street cars it's a problem like in toronto that's a huge issue people getting their their tires stuck in, in street car tracks in seattle yeah yeah <laughs> in seattle too but uh yeah absolutely fascinating story to hear about what's happening there in ballard with the missing link and how much people are spending their time and energy in either getting that done or doing the ab absolute opposite. It's absolutely wild. So I hope something gets figured out in the near future, maybe even before the next time I come to visit for a ride. That'd be yeah. cool. Well, what's really frustrating is like, so one of the, the main proponents, or the main opponents <laughs> of the trail, the, the main people who have been fighting it, owns a, uh, a cement company. And we always point to the Granville Island cement factory that's there. Like, you know, here's, you know, here's a facility that's operating in a, place that is friendly reasonably friendly um to to people who are not a cement truck driver <laughs> um you know they've found ways to like be part of such a neighborhood rather than just be in opposition to it all the time you know like trying to like, like there's other ways to approach your business like you know the city is coming closer and closer to you you know, this is very valuable land. This is a very desirable place to be. Um, and I know that's frustrating for like industrial businesses. Um, and, and yet it's the reality. Like you have a very popular neighborhood one block away from your business. You can just keep fighting forever, which seems to be your plan and eventually lose. Or I don't know, adapt, <laughs> like find a way to like be a good neighbor, you know, like maybe like, the place outside your workplace being like really hostile and unfriendly place to be is a bad thing. Like maybe if it was, if you were like made it nicer, I don't know, helped or helped the city at least make it nicer. That's not necessarily spelling like doom to your business. Maybe people would hate you less because <laughs> <laughs> I certainly have many strong negative feelings towards them. Yeah. It might be a net positive to your business in the end anyway. Yeah. Even if it did affect your business building this trail. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't, that's the thing is like, it wouldn't like what they're, they're worried that the trail is like a harbinger of like domestic uses for a business space. Like it's like a philosophical difference. Like, oh, like the people using this trail aren't like the people who need cement. Right. Even though the trail literally needs cement, but like other than that, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, you know, these are people who are like, enjoying the neighborhood as a person who is in the neighborhood and they're trying to keep that away as much as they can but they're literally it's it's, it's one well not even one block away it's like a half a block away from them now um it's like a very popular like nightlife district and 
business district and farmer's market, you know, like it's, it's already happened. The trail isn't like bringing that to their doorstep. It's already at their doorstep. All you're doing is making it really dangerous for all those people for no reason. Um, yeah. which is very frustrating. Um, I mean, I think they've, they've forever lost the ability, I guess, to be a good neighbor. Maybe it's never too late, but they've, they've made it clear that that's not what they want. So I don't know. I just can never understand that mentality. But then again, I don't have the mentality required to own a cement plant. So. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a whole thing that we can't even think. It's hard to even get into those shoes and try to feel what it would be like to, to be in that position. But hey, will they change it? Probably not, but you can only only hope. Yeah. And if that does happen, I'll be here to see it because that'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're getting long in the tooth. I have sure. to say thank you for joining me today. It's been fantastic to talk to you and kind of pick your brain about Seattle and what's been going on there, especially about the missing link. I'm just like, I'm forever fascinated by this now. I can, I'm going to be following this forever. Um, so this is the time of the show where I ask you to plug whatever you want. Where do people find you, your book, or any other things that you want to plug? Just go ahead, shout it out. Sure. I mean, I've already plugged the book. Uh, you can buy a copy at seattlebikeblog.com. If you buy it from there, then I will sign it and you'll get a free sticker. Um, and I get more money. So <laughs> please buy it from there. Um, and yeah, I'm on all of the social medias pretty much. Um, I try to be, be active on them all. Um, I've been loving the, the recent increase in blue sky use locally. <laughs> And so that's, that's been, been like actually made like hopping onto social media a little more fun and less like something I dread. So yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Um, we just did our Thanksgiving ride annually, but, uh, anyone in the Seattle area or wants to come down to the Seattle area next November, it's always the Saturday before Thanksgiving. We do a big, uh, food drive bike ride where we, I send people out with a list of places to go grocery shopping and uh, a list of food items that the food banks have requested and a handful of secret bonus challenges. And you and a team of up to four people goes out and gets as many as they can. And then it all gets donated to the food banks. And uh, it's just a lovely, wonderful day. So um, yeah, I guess those are my main things to plug. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for joining me today. Of course. It's been thank fantastic. You. So yeah, you can find Tom Fucoloro at Seattle Bike Blog. You can find his book there. And anyway, as I always say, thank you for watching.